All right, hello everybody and welcome to Tech Lore. Today we have Douglas Tooman on again on the channel. And today we're going to be talking about private forms of transaction, which leaks into cryptocurrency and Monero, which is definitely Douglas's main thing that he does. Um, and we'll also talk about Monerotopia a little bit, which is the conference that he's putting on. And we're just gonna talk about privacy in the financial world and lots of fun stuff there. Um, definitely a hot topic. Uh, I think that finances are probably one of the most difficult things nowadays to try to keep private aside from maybe like a home. And so we're gonna have a lot of relevant discussions here that probably apply to pretty much anyone who uses me, which probably is almost all of you watching. So welcome Douglas to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. Greatly appreciate it, man. Greatly appreciate it. Yes, and for context, so Douglas put on Monerotopia last year. He invited us to come along. We were media partners, Techler. That's the first time Techler even, like our team even met in person internally. Um, and so we went to that conference. It was a blast. And then later we also went to a different Monero conference. And so like we, we saw you there as well. Um, so we've met in person and met a couple times. So um, it's nice to have you on here. And why don't we just start off by talking about so we already had a conversation last year about uh, Monero, how it compares to Bitcoin, how it compares to Zcash, what is Monero and, and all that, kind of the basics. So just to kind of start there, because some people might have not watched it, what is Monero? What's the selling point of Monero? And also, like, I'm not really a pro crypto person in general, um, like cryptocurrency, like, yeah, like cryptocurrencies are nice, but really the only one I really see real value in myself is Monero. And I'm sure that you can probably do a better job of explaining what it brings to the table. Yeah. So, uh, like I say at nauseum on my show, it's, it's true digital cash, right? Um, so it, unlike, unlike Bitcoin, it is untraceable in its nature. Um, mainly because the Monero blockchain, the Monero ledger is obfuscated. So it functions similar to Bitcoin on a technical level, you know, in basic concept, it's a blockchain, there's nodes, uh, miners coming to consensus on blocks on transactions. But the primary difference is the added encryption that Monero has, which basically obfuscates the amounts of transactions. Uh, who the sender is and who the receiver is and effectively creating uh, an untraceable currency. And because of that, it is uh, fungible um, because no Monero transaction looks different than any other, right? They all look the same. There's no history attached to any Monero transactions and therefore you can't differentiate one transaction from the other. So they all look the same. Uh, therefore making them fungible as opposed to Bitcoin, where because of its transparent ledger, histories are attached to transactions. And then people that are viewing these histories can basically uh, assess Bitcoins differently based on the histories they have. Therefore, uh, one BTC doesn't necessarily equal one BTC because of the differentiating histories. And that's uh, what I say is kind of the biggest difference. There's other things to the Monero architecture that also add to its ability to be digital cash beyond um, you know, these three basic technologies I'm talking about. Uh, the way it's, it's mined, uh, Monero is CPU mined instead of ASIC mined. And that plays into the permissionless nature of Monero. So anybody with the CPU anywhere can permissionlessly access the network and start mining as opposed to having to obtain an ASIC, which is specialized hardware, uh, and not everybody can obtain them. Uh, and just the way the economics works out with Bitcoin, uh, the mining tends towards large centralized corporations that have an advantage. Uh, so Monero differentiates in that way, which ties into the security and decentralization of the network, uh, which makes it arguably more unstoppable by, you know, state authorities. Uh, and there, there's other differences as well, but I don't know if you want me to go into the, all, everything right now in the, in, in the first question. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's unpack that a little bit. So someone hears the term uh, fungibility for the first time. Uh, how would you describe what that is, why it's important? Uh, yeah, so it's important because it's what, you know, we, we 
what was said of Bitcoin is that it's you know the best form of, of money the world has ever seen, right? That was kind of its its claim to fame. Uh, it's since evolved into maybe arguably being sold to something else, digital gold, store of value, but initially sold as is the best form of, of money, especially in digital form. And uh, fungibility ties into that because you know for money to flow seamlessly without friction, when people are using it businesses are using it you don't want histories to be attached to the transactions because then people can start to uh, assess them differently and when i say people uh, you know, people in institutions and governments and because of that it could add friction into the system where now when you make a transaction it's questionable as to where did you get that bitcoin from where was it before you used it um, I would say that's really at its essence why it's mostly important. So you could have a truly frictionless transactional system where there's no question being asked when transactions are being made. It's like if I came to you and I you know, took a $100 bill out of my pocket, you don't stop and say, hey, Doug, uh, let me go quickly look this up and make sure you know, there's no, this wasn't used in any, uh, you know, illegal way. You didn't get it illegally. There isn't, it wasn't previously used by, for something illegal. You just accept it as legal tender on the spot. Um, and so for Bitcoin or crypto to function in that way, it's not, it's not legal tender by mandate, right? Fiat works because it, in that way, because one, it's, it's hard to mark dollar bills or, you know, add, add histories to them. But even beyond that, it's legal tender. So by mandate, it's fungible, right? By the government. Uh, for a cryptocurrency to be fungible, it's not going to be fungible by mandate unless, I don't know, maybe that's what Bitcoiners are hoping for, that it get, becomes fungible by mandate through the state. But really for it to truly be fungible, it needs to be innately fungible. And for that to happen, it has to just be that nobody can even apply uh, different opinions to transactions. And that only happens by way of having fungibility built into the protocol. Got it. And so to tie this to privacy is a good way of summarizing everything you just said. <sighs> to tie it from a privacy angle to be, hey, if if you're opening, or let's, let's just use a transaction as an example. You know, you want to buy a transaction, but they want to verify that you have the funds or that uh, how much money you have, because maybe then if they know how much money you have in your wallet, then they might ask for more money. Um, with Monero, that's not quite possible. Like they don't know anything about you. They don't know anything about your wealth, where it's been spent, what's happening to it. Whereas with something like Bitcoin, if they have your wallet address, they can just go into any block explorer, see your address and see all the transactions you've made for the lifetime of the wallet. They can see how much money is there total. They can see everything. Um, so there's like a huge privacy selling point here that comes along with Monero. Um, hmm. Are there any other cryptocurrencies that offer that kind of um, system by default, which Monero does by like, if you just use Monero, that happens just by default. You don't have to worry about it. Right. Do any other cryptocurrencies really do that that are relevant? Um, like, Nothing or, that... or is it kind of just Monero? Uh, yeah, nothing that has like network effect for that purpose, right? So there's other copycats that are trying to do the same thing, maybe slightly tweaking the, the technology in a way where it's faster or quote unquote, perhaps more private. So it'd be more difficult to, uh, you know, view, look into transactions and potentially um, unwind the obfuscation and try to figure out, you know, who's sending what to whom. Uh, but effectively, Monero is, you know, has kind of, won the network effect in that arena um so yeah i mean the closest zcash but zcash isn't by default it's opt-in um they're moving towards default uh privacy uh, but it's not there not there yet and yeah anything else that would be by default um just doesn't have the network effect and there isn't really any reason to use that over the other, because I mean, I start to sound like a Bitcoin maxi at this point, but there's a lot of truth to it, right? There is a lot of truth to net, like 98% of what makes these things valuable is the network effect, right? And by uh, network effect, you're pretty much referring to like the popularity of something and the likelihood of people to accept and use it. 
Right. That that gives it more utility, right? So if you have Monero and you can turn around and spend Monero and somebody else is willing to accept Monero, uh, it's a much it works much better as money than if, oh, I have uh, you know, I don't wanna you I have pirate chain. I'm not shitting on pirate chain, but you know, I ha I have I have pirate coin. Uh it's technically uh fungible and private, uses some different technologies. Oh, okay, but what's pirate chain? I don't accept pirate chain. I don't know pirate chain. Does anybody else you know? So like the net the network effect is a is a major component to these technologies. And so that's like kind of the BTC argument as to why even something like Monero it might arguably be useless, right? That's what they would say. Um, but the you know, network of first mover advantage at the end of the day is an advantage, not a guarantee, and network effect is very real but if you do something that's uh very different then you can overcome that right so if if you have network effect in something and then something else another technology comes along does everything you're doing plus adds this other critical feature then you can over you know overcome network effect for those purposes and i think that's where monero fits in so bitcoin tremendous network effect sucks up all the oxygen in the room in terms of being the biggest crypto but at the end of the day if you want to send something private privately anonymously and you don't want questions to be asked of where where your money came from and you don't want people to easily like you said easily look into your past transactions given that they could see your wallet you're going to default to monero and that's what most people in crypto choose got it and I so, say that with very real evidence, you know, you see the dark markets, you know, have primarily moved over to Monero. Um, ransomware hackers, they request Bitcoin or they say, or you can pay in Monero and we'll give you a 20% discount because they, they rather receive untraceable digital cash. So, yeah, especially. Yeah. Um, I mean, those are the people that need privacy most, which does not right. mean that's the only use case for privacy, which I'm sure um, no. you and myself and everyone watching is probably aware of, but um, those are the people who need privacy most for what they do, for better or for worse. But that's not necessarily representation for privacy's use case for everyone, which I would argue a lot more people should be aware of. Um, so on the topic of network effect, something I hear a lot and something that um, seems to be a common question, if anything, is, OK, so I want to buy a domain somewhere or crap, I want to get cookies from the grocery store. like. Can I use Monero to buy that instead of just regular cash? Um, I guess, so several questions here. A, is it better to just use Monero instead of cash? If someone has cash laying around and the grocery store accepts cash, is there any use case for Monero in that situation? Um, also, will that be the same answer in 10 years? Because I think that's an important thing to talk about. And will the grocery store accept Monero? If not, what are the other options that you have? Yeah, so probably if you went down to your corner grocery store and you tried to use Monero, they're probably not there yet accepting it. Uh, but like you said, use case is going to come into come into play when they're no longer accepting cash because cash no longer essentially exists, right? States are trying to eliminate true cash. Um, where Monero beats cash is one, arguably in fungibility. There's arguments to make that it's even you know more fungible and private than cash itself, right? You have the serial numbers. There are a way to track and trace, uh, but you know that's that's kind of you know, cash. Cash is is very private, uh, but where it beats it is is in digital form, right? So that's why you're really seeing the adoption in places like the dark markets, buying things on you know on online, right? For those purposes. Uh, if you're a vendor, right? If you're a vendor and you could, you know, you have the options of accepting different payments, you're going to want the payment to be sent in Monero. Like if you stop and think about it, and a lot of vendors, I think, are, are coming to that realization that they'd rather get paid in something that's untraceable as opposed to like, you know, PayPal or Venmo or somebody's credit card. They want that added advantage of not the whole world not seeing how much money they're receiving whether it's they don't want the state to see it, they don't want the corporations, the middlemen involved to see it. Um, and in terms of practically today, can you use it? There's bridges to using it. So you could, you could live off Monero today uh, if you wanted to. Um, I know some of the tools, but can you expand on some of those tools? Because like, 
Um, I know we've made videos about yeah. like cake pay and um, I know you have coin cards that I believe you enjoy, which is probably what you're referring to, but like, yes. what are some of the options that are out there for people? Uh, well, those are the biggest ones, right? So cake pay, which is built into cake, you could, you know, buy a hundred thousand different gift cards instantly on the spot. You could through your Monero wallet, you know, you could walk into, uh, a, one of the stores that uh, cold stone ice cream, your order, it's $12 and 39 cents. And on the spot, you could buy a gift card for $12 and 39 cents, show it to them and boom, you got your ice cream and you bought that gift card anonymously with only an email. Uh, so cake pay and they accept um, aliases too. What's that? And they accept aliases too. You don't have to use like your real email. You can just right. You have to use an email. You yeah. whatever email you use, you <laughs> use. Uh, I wouldn't recommend you. It's like your name at Google is probably not the right one to use in that in that use case. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and uh, coin cards. Um, those are the big ones that are like fulfilling that service. I should say too. Also now with Cake Pay, I mean they're they're constantly expanding. You know they're very usable in the U.S., but they're it's becoming usable in um, Europe and other countries as well. And now you could even you could buy prepaid uh, like Visa cards with it. Um, oh, you can. Yeah, oh. on the website, not through the app on the phone, but if you go through, you know, and log into your account at like through Cake, you know, through the the URL um through cake pay you can log in and then you can buy um like prepaid visa cards and stuff that's really uh, nifty yeah so so that's big what i mean and then but i i do you know i don't really see that as the old obviously i see that as a temporary bridge um the real way to use monero is the you know the vendors accepting it directly and like I said, I, we definitely see that growing where it would make sense to grow first, which is dark markets, because they have the, mo the most to, to lose uh, if they don't use something like Monero. But uh, I, we are seeing like ven new vendors every day. Like I just spoke to somebody on the phone today because um, they want to come down to Monero Topia and represent and they're selling electronics. They have an electronics website and they want to only accept Monero. There's a Monero marketplace that's gaining some traction, some real traction. Um, it's not a dark market, but it's more, you know, anybody can go on. They can become a vendor. You can basically do it in anonymous ways, but it's not the type of place where you probably want to set up shop and sell something that would be illegal. Uh, but, you, you know, it's a clear market. Anybody can create an account, become a vendor, and you can sell whatever you want for Monero. You could start selling, uh, I don't know, you have chickens in your backyard, you can start selling eggs, right? And people can, through through that marketplace, um, start buying eggs off of you with Monero. And we see that, that that's actually gaining some 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 nice traction. Um, and yeah, I would say it's, it's growing every day for those purposes. Where I've really seen it in the wild being used, the, like organically, uh, it was New Hampshire uh, at Porkfest. Uh, everybody at Porkfest, I don't know if you're familiar with Porkfest. I don't know if we spoke about this last time. It's a big libertarian, con it was going on forever. It's like a lot of the early Bitcoiners came out of there uh, that were going to Porkfest in the early days. Um, it's a week long hangout session at a camp campsite super cool anybody can come sell anything set up whatever they want there's uh talks going on it's 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 very very cool um but the the cryptos that are most accepted in pork fest where you see vendors that actually use these things these are early adopters of of a crypto they are accepting bitcoin cash uh monero and like dash those are like the big ones that you know so it's it's an eye opener like when people want to actually go spend and use and like litecoin not really bitcoin so much uh which is interesting yeah. um but yeah Qu yeah quick question um and just to because i'm sure people are like we've just been casually talking about dark markets and all these kind of things and before people think that we have you know like a hello kitty dark market that we're running <laughs> um selling like hello kitty books to to people with through monero um how come you're using dark markets as uh, like a gauge of effectiveness and like does it mean that we're encouraging dark markets i guess i'm i'm 
for people who are new who've never heard about this before, like they're probably wondering like why we keep referring to the dark market. So do you mind expanding a little bit there? Yeah, I, I always refer to it because I think it's the best test for the technology. And if it's adopted there, that means it works as intended. So I, I it's not, you know, and I, me personally as a libertarian, I'm, I'm very much leaning towards as free market as possible. Um, and so I, I love the idea of people being able to buy and sell uh, as they wish and just participate in commerce as they wish, peer to peer. Uh, but this is this is funny. I don't know if you can see this. Are you able to see that? Runs the dark web. Got it. I can't read the bottom. Monero. Part. No, it, Monero the top. So Monero, it runs the dark web. And then the bottom is, but I just use it to buy groceries. So this is a tweet that a BTC Maxi put out to as a way to kind of insult the Monero community, saying like, Monero people, they always say it runs the dark web, but you know they just use it to buy groceries. Like saying like, you know, uh, there is no use case for Monero, but only for dark market purposes. And like anybody who's saying they're just using to buy groceries is bullshitting, right? Mm -hmm. And which is completely false because there is good reason to why you'd want to use. I, I think it's the best tweet ever, and that's why I turned it into a T-shirt. I think it's it's just great <laughs> marketing. Like he summed up why marketing is so amazing, right? It does run the dark web. And yeah, you should use it to buy your groceries, right? Why it's use someone who doesn't understand card, the importance right? of Why? privacy? <laughs> right. And this is a, a, a you know a twenty-one million divide in, divided by or infinity divided by twenty-one million Mac, BTC max here, right? Like, and meanwhile, he's completely lost the plot and. I don't know if you ever realized or forgotten as to why crypto matters, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about uh, number go up, making people super wealthy. It's about having a technology that allows people to uh, participate in commerce without surveillance or censorship, all right? And through maintaining their privacy. Yes. And so using it to buy your groceries completely legitimate and if you have the option to why wouldn't you it just gives you advantage right in life over all those corporations that want to surveil you over governments that want to they're not doing it for your health to help you they're doing it to you know gain something from you and so uh saying that it runs a dark web proves that it works and then saying that but i just use it to buy groceries is actually the smart thing to do and it's what people in the Monero community are doing. They're not just on the dark web. Yeah, I'm really glad you talked about numbers go up. I, from my side of things, I very much dislike the broad <laughs> cryptocurrency community. It's very, 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 and I, I think we talked about this last time, but it's very just hype. Everything is hype all the time. Um, and it's very um, investment oriented, which I know last time we talked about, you said that the investment does bring some people along into the community, which is nice because that bumps the community and it helps the network effect as you were mm -hmm. talking about. But at the same time, when so much focus, I feel like when I talk, when I hear about Bitcoin, I don't hear people on the streets when Bitcoin is doing really well and everyone on the streets is talking about Bitcoin. Um, you don't hear them talk about the technology and the, the improvements that they're making on the Lightning Network to do X, Y, Z. They're talking about, oh, did you see the price went up? No, the price went down. And the, those are all right. the discussions. And even when you go to these more exclusive events, when you go to the conferences, when you see these conferences, a lot of them revolve around investments and um, technical analysis and all this other stuff. But um, when I went to Monerotopia last year and when I went to MoneroCon, that was just wasn't a thing. Like... Maybe I, I just dodged it, <laughs> but like, um, I don't think it was. It's just not something yeah. that, that was relevant. Like, all I heard was technology, the importance of privacy, the, impo the importance of um, having control over your funds, the importance of having this digital form of cash, using it, and actually using it too, you know? Like, you had um, the woman, what was her name, who talked about the Cuban situation? Oh, Martha Bueno. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's talking about, how like, trying to use Monero to enable, like, actual... Um, independence and people in these very dark situations and um, like there's real use cases and I feel like the conferences like Monerotopia are more set up to sell privacy sell technology and sell use cases more mm -hmm. than selling necessarily a coin like it, it doesn't have to be Monero you know right. It could be literally insert any other cryptocurrency. If it did what Monero did, then that's what you're there for is kind of the vibe that I get. Do you, 
I don't know. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, that's what we try to drive home. Monerotopia, Monero Khan does an amazing job at that as well. Perhaps it's even more technical. Uh, Monero Topia pretty technical too. I mean, what what I really try to drive home with Monero Topia is the building a parallel economy outside of the control of the state, right? So like that's you know. Uh, people ha being able in a private way to transact peer to peer, uh, and right now Monero is the best tool for that. So that's what we we talk about. Uh, obviously, I hold bags. Uh, you know, I'm all I'm all Monero. I'm invested in Monero. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to like you know uh, pretend that's not that's not the case. Um, but you know, I, I I like to tell myself if something significantly better, 10x better where it made a reason to pour it over from this behemoth that has this network effect in this purpose of digital cash to something else, then I would most certainly do that, right? It would have to be more so that Monero has some kind of flaw or something, right? And then there's something else that, that fixed that flaw. Uh, but until that happens, that's not really the case. And, you know, the price, it's not like we don't talk, you know, price is mentioned, right? A lot of people like, because mostly because as a metric, right? So just like saying, oh, it's used on the dark market. That's a met, right. That shows that it it has usage. It has network effect. Something else is the price, right? So it's limited. It like like Bitcoin. It is limited in supply. So if people if there's more demand than supply, price is going to go up. So it is an indication of the fact that that it's valued and you know it has network effects. So. Price is certainly is, is a factor, but it's not the main factor. And it's not, you know, not even that people talk about it. It's not what the devs in the core community are focused on when they're making their design decisions. And it's not what the community as a whole is on board for. So that's very important because that plays into how Monero evolves over time. So if it's like, oh, we want to... Um, boot ASICs and be CPU only. It's not about thinking, well, is this going to affect the price in a negative or positive way? It's, is this going to make Monero more resistant to state control? Is this going to make Monero more secure, more private? That's the driving factor. Whereas I think in Bitcoin, some of these other projects, the number go up has kind of co-opted it to the point where design decisions are more based on, will this uh, help the price go up, right? Will this be something positive for growth in, in price as opposed to growth in a decentralized, unstoppable technology? Got it. Um, all great stuff there. Yeah, I that, that all resonates very well with what I experienced going to both conferences. Um, and Monerotopia was really nice, too, for, my, for me. Um, mainly just the environment, too. Um, because not everything was even about the interesting thing is not everything was like, yes, I was like, I was there for Monero, but also when I spoke, it was a lot of privacy, um, discussions, which obviously directly ties into Monero. When I was there, I think I, I spoke about, um, simple privacy tools, making mm -hmm. privacy tools that are, that are stupid, easy to use that if anyone uses them, there's default privacy. You know, if you're on Telegram. You have to make sure you enable, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted chats with every single person you talk to. And then if you're in groups, it's just it's just a mess. On Signal, done by default. If you're using the program, you're done. Um, same thing with Monero. It's Monero versus Bitcoin. I see Telegram versus um, Signal as Bitcoin versus Monero. You know, Bitcoin, you can, you know, do hours of research and you can <laughs> mix your Bitcoin and hope for the best and kind of hope that whatever you did worked and that uh, everything ended up working out in your favor, or you can just use Monero and everything is just taken care of by default for you. Um, and where I'm going with this is when I was at Monerotopia, there were people who were running like custom ROMs on their phones just all around you. There were people who had like privacy screen protectors on all their devices. Like these were people who like care about privacy. And um, aside from it being like an awesome Monero conference, which I also find enjoyable it also felt like a great privacy conference which there aren't really any privacy conferences out there mm -hmm. um there you know you have things like defcon which is more of like the hacker side of things and you have a ton of infosec conferences but if anyone's ever been to an infosec conference they know that there's not much privacy discussion at a lot of them in fact a lot of the people at infosec don't seem to care much about privacy which you wouldn't really expect that mm 
Um, so there's not many communities that just naturally bake the privacy community into them, which is why I really like the Monero community. Yeah, this, this year at Monerotopia, I think we're even expanding that theme even more. Um, so like I said, a big part of it, obviously Monero Tech is a big part. The whole first day is really kind of Monero focused. We'll have different devs that are going to be there talking about the current state of Monero, and where Monero is headed in terms of its technology. And then we're going to have people kind of talking about it, uh, digital cash from like a, a philosophical liberty perspective, agorism, like wh why these things even matter on a philosophical level, why we want free markets and people to be able to use digital cash to freely, uh, you know, participate in commerce. Uh, but then we we are going to have the second day, which is going to be focused on other privacy tech projects. Um, so other competing cryptocurrencies too. So I, I think the the community, those that actually truly care about digital cash and privacy tech, it's it's not a tremendous community. Like globally, like you have you have a lot of followers. Like you you might be like a very good indication of how many people actually care about. It. It's not it's not tremendous, right? It's not like millions and millions and millions of people. So I think it's unfortunate that through crypto, you have people that are working on you know, uh, well, I'll tell you the ones we have, like Xano. I don't know if you've heard of Xano, Firo, Oxen. These are all That's like forks of Monero that are, you know, privacy coins. There's other ones, you know, obviously there's Zcash, there's Pirate Chain, there's Darrow. Uh, there's lots of them, right? But I think it's unfortunate to, to um, you know, be maxi about it and be like, well, Monero is the best, so we don't want to hear you at all. And then you're just, th with, with it, you're throwing out the followers of those cryptos that really, truly believe in these ideas. They want digital cash. They're just using, th they think theirs is better for whatever reason. And, you know, but I think it's a shame to not have those people want to participate in a conference among other people that also passionately care about digital cash. So we're trying to open that as much as possible. So like we're going to have talks from Xano, Firo, Oxen, Particle. Um, we're trying to get Aztec from ETH. That's like the privacy solution for Ethereum. We're trying to get people from there to come. Um, and then outside of that, other privacy technologies. So we'll have Session, which is also, that's the Oxen, Oxen guys. Yeah. So they made Session. So they'll be there talking about that. LokiNet which is, you know, a way to basically uh, interact on the internet anonymously, kind of like a Tor, a new version of Tor. Then we're going to have NIM. I don't know if you're familiar with the NIM project. Yes, um, they reached out, I think, or I heard, I don't know. But yes, NIM is, yes. Yeah, the, you know, they're they're basically, once again, uh, like kind of like a new, a new take on Tor, right? Uh, improvements there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to expand it more to privacy tech. Because like you said, there really is no, privacy tech conference yeah. and so we want all those all those people that care about that should be hanging out with monero people in the monero community and at least whether they adopt it or not at least get exposed to it and then they can make up their mind and decide whether or not it's you know what everybody says says it is yeah that's awesome stuff um all those talks sound uh, fantastic it's Really funny. So actually, the question I was thinking about asking you is you were talking about digital cash and it, it was coming to mind because um, we always and it, my mind went to comments and it's like we always get comments. So I, I guess this is kind of a, a two pronged thing. The first thing is we always get comments about anytime we bring up cryptocurrency. There's always someone in the comments who goes like, oh, this is a scam. This is stupid, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So I guess there's that. I want to ask you about that and what you think about that and how you would respond to that kind of sentiment. But also another question I get, and this is one that happens actually in real life for me when I bring up Monero or things to new people who've never heard of it, they seem a little confused on the difference between transacting with someone over Monero instead of Venmo. We know the difference. But if you could um, kind of remind some of the listeners who might be new to all of this, what is the difference between sending someone money via Monero instead of just sending them money on Venmo? What's the difference there? And finally, I wanted to, I just, you brought up Session and I was thinking of comments. We get like a million comments about Session. Um, people think that like we shield signal back here, which yes, I kind of do. But also like, I feel like I give signal the amount of love that it deserves. And I also crap on it when it deserves crap. And we've never had a signal developer 
on for an interview, but we have had a session developer on for an interview. Hmm. So like we had Key Jeffries on. Um, I don't know is Key the one who's going to be doing the talk. Yeah, he'll be he'll be one of the speakers. Yep. So We're there you go. Two people from that team from Oxen. They're going to be a few guys down there. Yeah, he's awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, that's awesome. So if anyone who's been on TechLore before and you've been subscribed for a long time and you saw that interview with Key, Key will be at Monerotopia. So that's all really cool stuff. Um, so I'm sorry, I asked like a two, I guess the two main questions just to summarize that. One, um, <laughs> I'm starting to forget the questions. I remember the second question, which was, okay, you know, I do remember them. How do you deal with people who just go cryptocurrency? They hear the word cryptocurrency and they're just running away. And I think that probably ties into that second question a little bit too, which is like, what's the difference between just sending someone money on Venmo or PayPal mm -hmm. and using something like Monero? Yeah, and before I forget too, Seth for privacy will be there. I, know, I assume well, your your crowd knows Seth. Uh, he yes. was at the first one. He's a he's a big Monero guy um, for all the right reasons, and he's obviously a big privacy tech guy. So he'll be there. Probably, I don't know if he's going to give a, a privacy talk or probably be a Monero a Monero talk. Um, Good stuff. We actually but, did an interview with Seth in Portugal, and it was recorded and has never been published. So that will be published soon, people. So oh, you can see wow. Seth as well. You never got it. Okay, yeah. You we never got that published. So everybody loves Seth because he's he's you know I mean we don't have to. It's Seth. You know he's he's <laughs> a very intelligent guy and he just breaks it down. It's it's very factual when he talks. Yeah. Um, and Nate, Nate, you're you work New with. The new oil, yeah, from the new yeah. oil. Uh, for those who watch surveillance support, Nate will be at Monerotopia as well, and so. he'll he'll be speaking. We want him to give like he wanted him to kind of give the talk that you gave, you know, kind of run that aspect, kind of give the overall privacy tech best privacy use cases. But uh, <laughs> to answer your questions, yeah, for people that are like crypto's a scam, uh, I don't blame people for, for saying that, given everything that's happened in crypto, right? Uh, and a, and 99.9% .9 of crypto is a scam. Uh, but the core concept is proven and it works building a decentralized system and you need a, you need a token to run it. Uh, and you know, so things like Bitcoin, things like Monero, and maybe a few others are not, are not scams. Um, if you find value in this idea of being able to transact peer to peer without going through a third party and that ties into the venmo question venmo i mean you're you're using you're using a company you're basically you're you're you know it's like being on facebook right so you're using uh, a third party to do your transactions it goes on their service i mean in venmo it's the most ridiculous form of it because they literally show you that they're watching you right it's like you could see what your friends are transacting you could see you know like a feed of it it's kind of hilarious and like the, it's a hilarious that it took off right that people are like oh this is great i could i could not only can i spend money on it but i could show the whole world what i'm spending <laughs> as i'm spending uh, spending it and tell everybody and now you know the government has stepped in in the us saying like i think any venmo transactions over 600 are automatically you know uh being uh sent to the irs right like it's on their radar and you know this isn't not an argument like don't pay taxes but I don't think you know government should default be able to see all your transactions. It should be more of a kind of an opt-in, and you tell them, right? Because you you want we don't have to get into it. It's all this libertarian idea, like you know we don't. Well, you should have the personal power, right? Where where governments aren't just at will taking money from you when they decide that you owe it, um, and so. Yeah, the the Venmo thing is just, just nothing more obvious than that. It's a third party that you're passing your money through, and transactions. Yeah, they're super cheap. They're basically free. But you have to ask yourself, you know, right? Uh, if it's free, what wh what is their you know where they're getting their value from? What is their business model? And their business model is from tracking and tracing your transactions and having that data and knowing how you spend and using that data. Uh, to make money, right? So you and so with Venero, with crypto, it, it takes away, it destroys that business model. It takes away any third party, uh, and, and including not just not just the banking system and companies like Venmo, but it actually eliminates the state as well as a party to the transaction. So there's literally nobody in between you and the other person you're sending your money to. It's just this network that's run by essentially 
people that are also benefiting from using the network. Yeah. And um, what this reminds me of is, you know, you mentioned digital cash earlier with digital cash. You know, you can meet up with a friend, you owe them $20. You can take out a $20 bill, give them the $20 bill and the transaction's done. There was no one there that had to take the $20, make sure it was legitimate, hold it in the sky, give it to them and then write down legally what happened there. There's no intermediary there. So um, that's what you're getting at there. And the alternative, I guess the best way of expressing Venmo in real life would be, you know, you go to a grocery store and um, you pay with something with a debit card and that transaction is now visible to Visa. It's now visible to the grocery store. The grocery store can keep tabs on how often you go there, how often you spend, what you buy there. Um, and they can share that information with other people. They can keep that information and keep it in an insecure method. So just any attacker can go and grab that data someday. Um, so even if they don't mean ill intent, uh, that's still a problem. And that's the problem with every service. Like that's fundamentally one of the things that I think is really unfortunate about Venmo is even if Venmo doesn't sell your data and they keep everything and they do everything privately, there's nothing stopping them from having a data breach someday and leaking everyone's financial information. Mm -hmm. So that's another layer to this too that I feel like isn't normally brought up is that you, you're always risking a data breach if something stores data on you. And this is actually a cool selling point to Monero from a corporate perspective you have less risk to your users if you accept Monero. If you're a company and you're doing transactions, yes, it might make taxes harder if, um, if you're going that route, but you don't have to worry about handling financial data of your users. Mm -hmm. All you see is a wallet and this random address that isn't even the person's address because, mm -hmm. right, Monero uses um, a private address and then a public address, and that's is it different every time? If the same person kept sending me Monero, would it come in from the same address? So the scenario is what? Like if I send you... if you, Let's say today you send me one XMR. Right. And then tomorrow you send me one XMR. In my wallet, it'll show, okay, one XMR today, one XMR. Well, one XMR yesterday, one XMR today. Would it show as being received from the same address if you sent it from no, the same wallet? No, 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 absolutely not. You have no idea where that Monero came from. There's no so way of saying, to like, oh, that must be the same guy that sent it to me. No, no, there's nothing to look Got at. It. Got it. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I was just I was just double checking. I was fairly certain that's how it worked, but I was like, yeah. wait, it, it, no, okay. So I'm really glad that's not how it yeah. works. Yeah. So, yeah. In fact, it, it, it's like one of the things that's hard with Monero, right? Because that's why Monero, I mean, don't anything. Monero initially had things, something called payment IDs. So you would know where, you know, where it's coming from, right? Especially because if you're a marketplace, you need to be able to associate the payment with the sender. So you know what they, who bought what. Uh, but now that's all built into the address and that's all, that's all taken, all taken care of. Um, uh, yeah, you had a point, there was a point I wanted to make. Oh, I think the one thing we didn't talk about, you know, so the, the Venmo thing, cause you're like, you know, Doug, what, why would my viewers even want to use crypto and, and, you know, versus Venmo or credit card. And, you know, it's, it, it is hard. We, we made some of the arguments, right? Like, cause what you whatever you don't want a third same reason why you might want to use signal versus you know telegram right because you don't want all your data out there you don't want this third party collecting all your data they can get breached you get stolen or they can use your data against you uh the state can come in and use it against you um it's also with money right you don't want anybody to be able to to stop you take away your money right you don't want them to be able to take it away with venmo that money isn't really yours right it's not a bearer mm -hmm. asset it's not cash in your pocket it's digits on a screen that says you have this much money on your venmo account but one day you might log in there and be like access denied you know for whatever reason you know uh you know the the world is changing fast right now, right? And PayPal it, it, and PayPal has been coming under a lot of fire the last couple of years. Yeah, they, you know, and they could they could they could stop their customers. Maybe they don't agree with something that you're doing. Maybe you're collecting payments for something, and maybe they don't like that that business that you're in. It doesn't. Uh, they don't think it's ethical for whatever reason in the, in their in their eyes. They could they could stop those transactions, and so it's really important for purposes of preventing tyranny at the end of the day. This is why I'm most excited about a technology like Monero and privacy tech in general, because I think it allows us to maintain our liberty in the digital age. Um, with everything being digital, tracked and trace, 
it's very easy for governments to mass surveil and then to start to affect the the populace uh, because of that information they have and that surveillance they have over everyone. And if they could even then surveil all your transactions, it becomes very troublesome if you want to, say, support some cause that maybe the current administration, which is, you know, perhaps maybe very powerful at that point in the country you're living in, doesn't agree with the political cause you you support. When you really think about what makes this technology so important, it's that, right? It's not you can go buy drugs on the dark web. That proves that it works. But what's really the most important thing is when society needs it for purposes of maintaining an open and free society without some tyrannical government stopping some minority uh, group of people that have some political belief, you're going to need tools like Signal so you can communicate so they can't stop you from communicating. You need tools like Monero so you can transact without them stopping you from doing that to support your cause. It's very important. It, so it sounds a little crazy, but you know, honest, it sounds crazy maybe like 10 years ago. But given the the way the direction of, of the world is moving right now, I think a lot of people are starting to realize it's not as crazy as it sounds. Uh, we we need the, we need liberty to be built into the technology. We can't just rely on governments to to promise that they're going to give it to us as they bolster up all this surveillance tech and get in bed with these big technologies and just become more and more powerful. We need it to be we need it to be embedded in tech that they don't have control of. Yeah, I really like that because now you're taking I, I you did a really good job of zoning. I don't think it should sound crazy to our audience because our audience we're privacy advocates, right? We're always talking about the importance of tools like Tor and how it can make you more private and like fundamentally like everyone has a different purpose for privacy and all Monero is doing is enabling privacy on the financial front, which is traditionally a very hard thing to do. So that is really what I also see Monero as um you're definitely like I think a lot more involved with Monero, but for me as a privacy advocate, the way I see Monero is this is a privacy tool like Tor, like Signal, like Briar, like Session, like all these other privacy tools. But this one enables something that no other one does, which is it enables financial privacy. Um, and in a peer to peer method that is controllable and very hard to stop, um, like anyone can download a Monero wallet, host their own Monero node, do whatever they need to make Monero work for them. So it's a very powerful privacy tool. And if people are asking, well, why do I need to hide my money? Why do you need to hide your web searches? Why do you need to hide your messages? Like, it's the same question. It's about privacy. It's about what you want to share with people. And the reality is you don't really have a choice nowadays of being able to transact privately unless you're going to use cash, which is kind of being phased out. So like, where what are you left with? You're left with tools like Monero. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other ways. And I guess that's something I wanted to quickly touch up on because you compared... Um, you compared, what was it? I think you compared Venmo to Monero as Telegram is to Signal. I actually don't like that one as much because I think that Monero is more like Briar because Briar is peer to peer. Signal mm -hmm. still goes through a central entity. Yes. So I guess that's, so here's where I'm going. Is there that Signal middle ground? Because Signal offers a lot of perks of having a centralized entity, but Signal never really sees anything about its users outside of um, a hashed phone number the last time you were online. That's really mm -hmm. about it. And that's been mm -hmm. shown in court cases and everything. So is there kind of that Signal middle ground for financial privacy? Um, where maybe someone doesn't need peer-to-peer, -peer, Monero, balls-to-the-wall privacy. They have more of a middle ground option that might still use fiat or maybe something else that's a little bit more accessible and a little bit already widely adopted. You're saying, does that exist now? Or you're saying, do I think that's going to be a thing? I guess both. Like, do you think that should exist? And um, is it already a thing that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's attempts at that, right? I mean, I, th I think that's also kind of what the government is saying that they're going to provide people, right, with CBDCs, right? They're going to provide central bank digital currencies. And don't worry, they're going to uh, make sure that it's it's private, right? And, and so, but at the end of the day, you're, you're trusting... You're trusting this third party. You're trusting the government. And at the end of the day, with Signal, I know like maybe tested in courts, but you are trusting Signal, right? You're trusting this this third party. Um, it's 
it's there's there's going to be but it it becomes down to like why why take that risk when you can use the decentralized version that's that's how i would look at it you know why would i i mean i guess if if you're just getting some some like a lot of usability out of this kind of middle ground solution um yeah but... well i think it comes down to usability accessibility mm -hmm. as well because using briar you know you have to it's same thing with session you have to like copy this id or scan yeah. someone's ID, whereas Signal, yeah. if you just use your contact list. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like, you can develop centralized, very trustless models, with, whereas with Signal, Signal can have a full server compromise. The CIA can host Signal servers for all we care. Um, it doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, Signal's designed in a way the open source, the servers mm -hmm. are open source, but, like, you can't verify that's what they're running on their servers. You never can. Um, so that's why every, everything is done um, on the device. So like the clients are what's actually doing the end-to-end -end encryption. You can verify the clients. You can verify the code that's running on the clients. And so everything is designed in a way where like it definitely is at least based on what the source code is telling us as secure and private as it can be in this day and age. Um, so I guess like that is like I struggle here because um, I'm surrounded by people who love decentralized things. And I love the concept of decentralized things, but every time I use decentralized things, maybe funny enough with the exception of Monero, because Monero, it doesn't feel like I'm using something decentralized. It just feels like I'm using something and it just happens to be decentralized. But like mm -hmm. everything else that I've used that's decentralized, I can feel that it's decentralized because of that lack of usability, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, or just the way it's designed, like on Matrix, you know, the way Matrix works is confusing to a new person. I feel even Mastodon, like you have to join instances. Do instances integrate with each other? Can they see each other? Can I like and follow someone from a different instance? What instance should I join? And it's the same thing with Matrix too. You know, like how how does home servers work? How does all this integrate? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, um, big tangent there. I don't really have a question out of that, but I guess yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting. <laughs> and like I said, CBDCs are Trump promising that there's something eCash. So like it's like another version, uh, not even really a CBDC, but there's you know there's the eCash Act that uh, that was passed in Congress where they're exploring producing like uh, a a digital do dollar that's a bearer instrument that would basically use a hardware device. Um, where you can pass, you know, thing dollars to each other digitally. It goes from me to you, uh, but not through this decentralized system. But you know, from device to device. So things like that are are, are interesting. There's going to be, um, yeah. I, I think what it really comes down to is governments want control over money, so they're for to trust that they're going to produce something that provide at the end of the day truly does provide people privacy and ability for them to rely on the fact that you know they all they have to do is hold the keys and they hold their coins i don't think they they're ever going to get create something that will give people that power and so the only way to create that is in a decentralized way because nobody wants to give people that that power Got it. So you're talking, the resilience of decentralization is really a great selling point there. Because yes, like we, we can pretty much, we don't care if servers, the si signal servers are compromised, but signals website can be shut down. Signal right. servers can be shut down mm -hmm. because it is centralized. All of that is a possibility. You know, next week, the US could theoretically ban end to end encrypted messengers. Right. The unstoppable, gone. the unstoppable nature of it. You can't create a, a centralized thing that will be as unstoppable as, as you know something like a decentralized crypto. Makes sense, and that's the same thing with Messenger. Same thing with Tor. You can't really block Tor. You can try, but Tor bridges are a thing. You can run proxies. You can get around that, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's not really the same thing with a VPN. You know, with a VPN, it, we're seeing what's happening in India right now, trying to ban VPNs. And VPN providers just have to pull I out of India. That. Okay. Wow, they're trying to ban VPNs in India. Okay. They're not necessarily. So they're banning VPNs that don't keep logs. Okay. Well, <laughs> in India, I, I guess I should specify that's actually what's happening. They're not banning all VPNs. Right. They're just saying you have to keep logs if you want to have a VPN server in India. Right. And so all the providers are just pulling out.
Crazy. Um, yeah. And I mean, China has been like very anti VPN for a long time now. You know, the Great Firewall of China is a term. So, like, yes, it's the decentralized nature of things that makes them more resilient to government control, um, which I think is a very important tool that most people can get behind when they see like the real impacts that are happening around the world. Um, so, I think that's really great and a very big selling point to all decentralized cryptocurrencies, but especially with Monero that bakes in privacy as well, because if you're using Bitcoin and it can track everyone who's using Bitcoin, is it really, is the decentralization and the ability to use Bitcoin actually helping you? Mm -hmm. exactly. if, if they can track what you're doing and find out who's doing it. So yeah, enough about that. Um, Monerotopia, just to wrap this up, go ahead, tell people all about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank, thanks for letting me fit it in during the interview too. But so it's going to be in Mexico. It's starting on Cinco de Mayo on May 5th. That will be the welcome party. That's a Friday night. And then after that, there'll be two days, full days of conference from like 10 a.m. You were at the last one. It was a marathon, right? So it's going to be like that, but two days. So from like 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. both days. Um, first day Monero focus, second day, like I said, it's going to be, you know, other privacy tech projects, other cryptos presenting, uh, and then also a lot focused on building a parallel, uh, economy outside of state control. So people presenting on those concepts, open marketplaces, solutions for that. Um, and there's going to be workshops. I think we have four workshops so far, like a Monero 101. We want to get the low it's in mexico city so we, we made it super cheap for locals i think 25 dollars if you're a local so you can come so we want to onboard new people so we created a, a workshop for them so they can receive their first crypto we'll have some spanish speakers down there helping us out with that we have like a monero 102 course which is like more like how to run a full node how to mine uh using p2 pool uh how to you know set up an e-commerce and accept monero uh, that's going to be a second workshop. Uh, then we'll have probably like a privacy tech workshop where people can, you know, learn best practices, uh, you know, what browser to use, all those things, the things that you, you talk about all the time, but we'll do that in person with, you know, in workshop form. And then we'll have NIM running a workshop, how to use NIM. Uh, and yeah, that, that basically covers it. Tickets are, we keep them super cheap. It's like, so $99 for general admission. Uh, we ask that people pay that, you know, if, if they can't, you know, afford that they could, you know, buy the local ticket. We, I, I mean, maybe we're going to ask, like, you need to be able to sing the, the Mexican national anthem. We, we really want it for locals. We don't want people taking advantage. Right. But, uh, I don't think people will. And then the VIP ticket, you know, uh, that one's like more pricey, but everybody's been buying the VIP ticket. So that, cause that then gives you access to the speaker dinner so all the speakers uh will be there so you can hang out with them and hobnob and that's really like uh, you know you went to these we, the, the obviously the talks are amazing the talks are great but the real like memorable moments and the most you get out of these things is just hanging out networking talking to all these other people that care so much about these uh, concepts and it's like you never talk more than you talk like You'll, you'll never have talked more than being at a conference like this because you're just constantly talking to very intelligent people that have so much they want to tell you and then you have so much you want to tell them. Um, and it's it's just great. It's a great time. Yeah, it's incredible. I had a great time last year. And the biggest wake-up call was being able to just talk about privacy to people in real life who actually understood it because I, I feel like you do a very good job of surrounding yourself with people involved with Monero and privacy, but I don't really have that. Like, I can't name a single person that I see on a day to day basis that in person I talk to about privacy. Like my job is kind of its own thing. And I talk about it here online to the public, but I don't really have anyone in real life to talk to about it. And when I went to that conference, it was one of the first times I ever got to just like freely speak to other people who care about privacy. And I could just be like, hey, like what messengers are you using? <laughs> and they'll, they'll understand like the whole question and the context and the nuances around it because that's what they live in as well. Um, so that was something that was awesome for me. Um, great trip, awesome time that I had. So I highly recommend people go if they're on the fence about it. Um, it's a, it's a freaking blast. I, I had a great time. Pro tip, do not, do not have your flight get in there like the night before the conference starts in the morning <laughs> and then don't leave right after the conference ends. Exhausting. Do not do it. Plan some time for yourself if you decide to go. Try to get there at least a day in advance so you can kind of relax, check out Mexico City, do some fun stuff because um, 
yeah, that was um, my first time, like, really going to a conference to speak at a conference and, you know, Marathon. trying to see what I could do. But do not recommend doing that. But I still had a great time despite being just sleep deprived the whole time. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's in a beautiful part of Mexico City in the Roma district. It's kind of very bohemian. It's in a community, outdoor community center. So it's not like this number go up maxi fest vibe. There's not like Lambos parked down in front. It's, you know, uh, run by the, the community. It's a basically, um, yeah, an outdoor community center. It's run by this group that that essentially took over a public park there many years ago, I think like 20 years ago, and they've just overtook this land in Mexico City, and they oh, they let people come and throw events there. So it's a very bohemian, very nice, uh, very nice crowd that runs it. Um, and it's, it's, it is open to outsiders so they could easily come in and integrate into the conference. We're going to, oh, we're going to have a Monero marketplace there. So we're going to have, we hooking up with a local Mexican marketplace that does like vending at this community center. So they're going to come bring all their vendors and they'll be there for the two days and they're going to be accepting Monero for those two days. So we'll onboard all them. You can spend Monero to buy, you know, tacos and whatever it may be bottled bottle tequila um so yeah it should, it should be cool it's gonna be a good hangout yeah definitely come if you're gonna come then you know show up i would say show up thursday uh and maybe maybe leave uh, show up longer if you want to spend some more time um but yeah you don't want to miss the uh cinco de mayo hangout party it's gonna it's gonna be fun and oh yeah. monerotopia.com i don't even think i said the website there you go so we'll that, leave it in the where, description as well that's where you want to go yeah so if you're interested, definitely go check it out. Douglas will be there. Um, Seth for Privacy will be there. Nate from The New Oil, who's my co-host on Surveillance Support, will be there. People from Session will be there. People from NIM will be there. Lots of Monero developers will be there. It's going to be a good time. Definitely go check it out. Um, and just to finish it out, I want to thank you for your time, Douglas, uh, and being here today. I also want to thank, oh, there goes my dog. Um, I want to thank my dog for shaking. I want to thank um, everyone who's listening uh, for getting to the end of this interview. And I hope that everyone enjoys it. And I really want to thank you, Douglas, for being on. Henry, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for, for coming down last year. You, you, you were an amazing element at the conference. You brought, a, you brought a nice vibe, you and your team. You guys do amazing. I told you this last time. Uh, jealous of your ability to put out amazing content. We, we certainly lack that ability over here uh, on, on my, my show. You've, you've mastered it and you're able to uh, communicate these complicated topics in very simple ways. So kudos to you always. And thank you for allowing me to uh, essentially get the word out um, and Aerotopia on your platform. I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course, man. No. And thank you for all the kind words. Um, a lot of hard work back here. So thank you very much. Sick Henry in the future coming in to say that they actually hooked us up with a 10% discount for all of you. So if any of you are interested in going to Monerotopia, use the code Techlore, our name, Techlore, for 10% off to go to the conference. Just to reiterate, I went last year and it was an absolute blast. And if it weren't for scheduling issues, I'd go this year as well. And I'm really bummed I can't go. But for those who can go, at least try to use that code TechLore so you can get 10% off. Thanks for watching this interview again, and we'll see you next time on TechLore.